Hi, Maria. Hi, Scotch Trekker. Be creative. How am I supposed to be creative with a 26-year-old reboot episode? This is how. I can't believe that our caretaker would forbid us to open our eyes. In this pilot episode, we meet a newly assigned Starfleet crew as well as a group of freedom fighters who call themselves the McKee. Both crews are going to have to work together if we're to survive. We're zapped into the far reaches of the Delta Quadrant and we're repeatedly offered corn on the cob by insistent hologram on the Lucidae farm. Have some nice fresh corn on the cob! Fresh corn on the cob! Corn on the cob! Corn on the cob! Corn on the cob. How well did you feel this episode established the premise of Star Trek Voyager? For me, I thought that this really did establish, like, you know, like right from the gate, you're going to know that they're going to be lost in space, basically. You know, mm. no pen intended. Sounds as though you've heard this story before. But I thought it did a good job of, like, kind of just setting up the tone of they're going to be running across, like, brand new people. We've already made some friends here. And some enemies. I thought it did good, you know, because I, I wa- re-watched the episode after many, many, many years yesterday. On screen. I thought, like, still, you know, I still enjoy this episode many years later after afterwards. I'm pleased you're enjoying yourself. How about you? Have, do you still enjoy the episode? Yeah, I think it's really good. I think it sets up the characters really well. Mm-hmm. It's a bit of um, interplay for all of them. And a bit of backstory. With right. For all of them. And some Kim. Mr. Paris. Welcome aboard. A few scenes from this episode were initially filmed with Canadian French movie actress Jean Vierre Rougeau playing Captain Janeway. How well do you think she would have played that role if she had appeared regularly in the part? On the DVD, on screen, they have the um, the footage of this actress um, playing the role. And oh, she was bad. I'm sorry. No disrespect to that actress. This was just not her genre. It's not crunched on yet, Mr. Kim. I'm so glad they got Kate McGrew because she she brought it. My name is Captain Catherine Janeway. Like, she just had that, that presence on the screen to carry a captain role. Captain Catherine Janeway of the Federation Starship Voyager. A very impressive title. I have no idea what it means, but it sounds very impressive. I'm glad they made the decision. I think, actually, the actress also knew that it just wasn't for her. It is all the basic characteristics of an M-class planet, except there are no nucleogenic particles in the atmosphere. I think it was... um interesting to see how she might have played the part origin mr kim i'm not sure i think they're completely different takes on the role i agree that you're you're right that kate mulgrew had the longevity obviously mm-hmm. she's the captain i don't think bujold would have um been able to last lo- that long in the part how effective do you think seeing ds9 in this episode was I thought that like seeing ds9 allowed for the like continuation because like you know ds9 was running at the time you know, mm-hmm. and so the, it was a nice little overlap, you know, like to show like the continuation that it is in the same same t- um, time period as like Deep Space Nine, Next Generation. So it, so it showed like a continuation, you know, in the Star Trek timeline, 24th century still. So it was nice just to tie it in. So and I enjoyed that scene with um, Harry Kim getting uh, tr- <laughs> with Quark. That was actually quite comical. Come on. Thanks. Didn't they warn you about Ferengi at the Academy? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that, that, that was funny, so. I thought it was quite interesting. I recently found out and added it onto Memory Alpha that there was a, a deleted scene that takes mm. place just like slightly after that with Kim and Paris and they go and view the, the warp core on Voyager. Mm. That was quite interesting. Do you wish any of the Starfleet officers who died during the transit to the Delta Quadrant had survived to become characters in the rest of the series? Actually, no. Because, like, if it wasn't for their death, the other characters would not have been able to shine as they did. Because, like, take it for an example. If the if the medical officer... Here, this is the prime one. If the medical officer would have lived. Oh, yes. The observer. Would Robert Picardo's character would have shined the way it did? Please state the nature of the medical emergency. You know, like, he needed that death of that character in order to shine. 
A replacement must be requested as soon as possible. I am programmed only as a short-term emergency supplement to the medical team. Well, we may be stuck with you for a while, Doc. And uh, he became a very instrumental part of the show. I mean, sometimes he was just the absolute comic relief for the show, you know, along with Neelix. I enjoy a joke as much as the next man. Obviously for the first officer. Lieutenant Commander Cavett. If he wouldn't have died, Chakotay, what, what Chakotay would have done? They've got me. You know, so that's why I was just like, no, you know, like I think they set it up purposely and I think it just worked out well that um, those people who died, then that, that allowed the integration of the, yeah. of the marquee. You know, and also for the doctor to shine the way he did shine for seven seasons, you know. I saw also um, the first officer who died, uh, Commander Cavett, as well as the chief medical officer were a bit sort of stern. The captain asked if you were on board. You should check in with her. Uh, I haven't paid my respects to the captain yet either. Well, Mr. Kim, that would be a good thing for a new operations officer to do. You know, like they're talking with... Uh, Kim, you know, like chatting behind Paris's back sort of thing in the mess hall. Right, right. You know, that was very interesting, though. Like, I want to touch on that, actually. It's very interesting, that interaction between, like, you know, the, the first officer, Harry Kim, and uh, the medical officer talking about Tom Paris and about the incident that happened, you know, during the Academy. But not my last. It's just really interesting. It just kind of shows, like, even the 24th century, like, your mistakes can be carried over. Like, just like today's society. You, you mess up, you know, you mess up good enough, then it's going to be held on you, like, forever and ever and ever and ever, you know. After they cashiered me out of Starfleet, I went out looking for a fight and found the Maquis. And on my first assignment, I was caught. And that's also really interesting. One thing I did like about re-watching this episode is how they opened up over at the penal colony, um, you know, at the, at, you know, over in New Zealand. And cause yeah. like, they've never shown that before in Star Trek, you know, like they've only shown, think about it. They've only shown a brig. That's all they've ever shown. You know, and so it was interesting, like, uh, to go to, like, a rehabilitation. They don't call it a prison, but it's a rehabilitation, you know, mm -hmm. center. I've been told the Rehab Commission is very pleased with your work. They've given me their approval to discuss this matter with you. Well, then I guess I'm yours. Well, it's just something different to see mm -hmm. in the 24th century. Yeah, so. especially in Earth. Right. That's our ship. That's Voyager. Intrepid class. Sustainable cruise velocity of warp factor 9.975. 15 decks. Crew complement of 141. Bioneural circuitry. I thought also the uh, Betazoid study who is in the shuttle with Paris and takes into Voyager when he first gets there. I thought she would, her character concept is kind of quite cool, I thought. Study, you're changing my mind about Betazoids. Um, yeah. He was locked up in, you know, in penal colony, man. He, he had, he had had a company of a woman for a while. Do you always fly at women at warp speed, Mr. Paris? Only when they're in visual range. But I thought if there were any characters who I would have kept from those who died, it probably would have been her. Yeah, maybe. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, the, yeah, she was a short-lived character. I think she just was that scene, though. She's also, I think, at the, the con or the helm of Voyager. Oh, Voyager. okay. Lieutenant Stoddy, lay in the course and clear our departure with operations. Course entered. Ops has cleared us. In terms of the other series pilots, how would you rank this episode? I would rank it up there pretty high. Um, I think I'll rank it like, um, I'll probably rank it second. First one would be Farpoint from Next Generation. Because Next Generation introduced the most awesome character in the whole entire universe, Q. We call ourselves the Q. Oh, thou mates call me that. It's all much the same thing. I did not become a Q fan until like the second or third episode that he was in. You know, because at the very first episode, I thought that dude was annoying. Damn annoying at times. I'm like, who is this guy? You know, but then he grew on me like fungus. <laughs> and now I'm a huge fan. Splendid, splendid, Captain. In Farpoint, remember, you had the ship separation. You can't top that. Mm. You know, like that was super cool because that was the first time ever, ever seen that feature on any ship ever, 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 ever. So what did you think about the decision that Janeway had to make about whether to not destroy the caretaker or to destroy it? I intend to destroy the array. 
And did it fall under the prime directive as a, a Tuvok was talking about? Presumably mean the caretaker's array? Yeah, the array. Yeah, the array. I agree with Janeway choosing to destroy the array. Otherwise, it would have enabled the Kazon to use that technology for their nefarious purposes. They could have used it to rain all kinds of destruction on that part of the Delta Quadrant otherwise. The Kazon must not be allowed to gain control of it. They will annihilate the Akampa. As for the Prime Directive, Jane would clearly points out to Juvok that they're already involved without intending for that to happen. So they're just trying to do the best they can given those circumstances. They never asked to be involved, Tuvok. But we are. We are. Also, it's the caretaker's dying wish that the array be destroyed, so Voyager's crew is simply honoring that. Yeah, it was the caretaker's dying wish. It, it was. But like at the same time, it's just like, well, the Ocampa, they are kind of helpless because uh, because like they became so dependent on the caretaker. <laughs> They're children. Children have to grow up. And so like, I was like, yeah, I could see like where, you know, the destroying of it. But then at the same time, is this like, I mean, you didn't volunteer to come out. You were taken against your will, 70,000 light years away. That array is the only way we have to get back home. You know, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here. I don't know what I would have done in that situation. It's a fine crew and I've got to get them home. But let me ask you this. What are your thoughts on the Kazon and the Ocampa? What were your initial thoughts on those races? This way, please. I think the Kumper are physically a bit bland looking and not alien enough. The elders would say that's against the caretaker's wishes. But I like the fact they live on the ground, as well as the backstory that ancient Kumpa were apparently led there by the caretaker. We've lived here for over 500 generations. But before that, you lived on the surface? Until the warming began. The warming? When our surface turned into a desert and the caretaker came to protect us. Our ancient journals tell us he opened a deep chasm in the ground and led our ancestors to this place. Since then, he has provided for all our needs. He designed and built this entire city for us after the warming. Also because Cass was to become a regular character and would have a relationship with Neelix, I guess the show's production staff didn't want to make her too monstrous looking. Excuse me. Don't blame Neelix. A lot of people think didn't like the Kazon regarding them as too much like Klingons. Maybe I'd do better if I had a little Klingon blood in me. But I think they held a lot of potential and I was eager to see more. I also think Caretaker is one of the better episodes and loved the design of their vessels and weaponry. I never got into the Kazon. There was just something about them. It wasn't because of what, what you just said, like, oh, they're close to the Klingons. No, I just looked at them as like some dirty race. I'm sorry, with some nappy hair. Like they just weren't aesthetically pleasing. But I just never got, I just never got into them. As for the Ocampa, you know, like this is interesting. Like um, when I was watching this episode yesterday, you know, like I remember like my initial thoughts of first, I felt sorry for the Kazon. Here they were without any water. You know, like struggling to survive on a desert. Kazon sex control this part of the quadrant. Some have food, some have ore, some have water. And then you got the Ocampa. Does the caretaker provide your meals too? In fact, he does. Who are basically living in a luxury mall down below with all the food, you know, everything. And I'm like, wow, the, these are jerks, the Ocampa. Scurrilous insults. But then you get to like see, like, you know, like how it actually really is. Really? So then I was like, oh, wow, you know, like, yeah, I don't really care for the Kazon at all. I'm really not interested. Really? But one thing I wanted to bring up was like, how did the caretaker impact the Ocampa? When we ask, we're told to trust the caretaker's decisions. It's like the Ocampa's um, potential to question things and, and develop like questioning minds is sort of restricted. I thought that could be seen as sort of analogous to like religious fundamentalism. He never communicates directly. We try to interpret his wishes as best we can. I thought it was quite um, sort of Grodenbray esque and, mm -hmm. and like the, you know, being wary about um, like how religion and stuff can have an effect on people's minds. Right. We're explorers from another galaxy, but we had no idea that our technology 
be so destructive to their atmosphere. I really feel that he did more harm than good. I know he was trying to repay a debt because the technology of the caretaker destroyed the planet. I get that and I feel for that. However, if he has the technology to destroy an environment, wouldn't he have the technology to be able to transport the Ocampa to another planet within the solar system? Don't you understand? I don't have time. And then allow the race to develop and mature. Oh, that, that isn't possible. I barely a, enough strength to complete my work. Because they created such a dependence on the technology that it hampered their growth. I discovered quite by accident that the moss that grows on certain fruit trees has healing properties. They didn't really have a, like a lot of technology, a lot of like medical expertise to, to help because they didn't have to develop it in order to survive. So if, you, if you, everything is handed to you, why evolve? Why grow? Yeah. Most of the species we've encountered have overcome all kinds of adversity without a caretaker. It's the challenge of surviving on their own that helps them to evolve. Overall, you know, like I thought it was a pretty good episode. You know, I, I think it, it held its own throughout the years. I want to thank you for your hospitality. Is there anything like super memorable? No, but I really did like uh, the use of what the caretaker used for the imagery to interact with the crew of Voyager. <laughs> Crews scattered around this farm, Captain. They're using this Americana, you know, um, on the country farm. You know, I mean, you can't get any more American, you know, with the red barn and the corn on the cob, and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so do you think that that was an effective way for the caretaker to introduce himself and why? In my opinion, it clearly wasn't very effective. I don't think he accounted for the Starfleet officers having tricorders and being able to work out that he, his companions, and the environment around them were all illusions. Whoa. What? It's Borosistian life signs. I think his appearance as an illusory banjo player worked better for the audience than for the Voyager crew. That said, it was probably slightly helpful in establishing a dialogue between him and the crew mem human crew members that they took the form of an individual from their own species. Yeah. Well, I can understand though, like, you know, you're, you, he scanned like their database mm -hmm. and then like, I guess he had to figure out like the best environment to, I mean, like if you would have jumped right on into like the, the, the array and seen your friends, like with needles driven in their abdomens, you know, I, I don't think that you're going to be as, you know, as willing to talk than like trying just to create an environment, even though it was fake, you know, but just trying to, I guess, like, to make you feel comfortable. Can you tell me why we're here? Oh, we don't mean you any harm. I'm sorry if we put you out. Why don't you just put your feet up and get comfortable while you wait? Wait for what? Isn't anybody hungry? Come on now, make yourselves at home. I'm sorry if we put you out. I, I, I think the caretaker was just doing the best he could, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Set a course for home. We're alone in an uncharted part of the galaxy. We've already made some friends here and some enemies. We have no idea of the dangers we're going to face, but one thing is clear. The Scotch Tracker Far From Home is here to stay, so join us next time. Track you later. Doesn't anyone know how to turn off the program when they leave? <laughs>